if you're participating, they offer receptacles going by. If you're using a, giving there, please use an envelope, and then you can give by kiosk, or you can go right online uh, at the rockellis.com and, and uh, take care of it that way. I want to thank you for being here today at The Rock, and uh, I want to keep you informed that uh, back behind me, at the beginning of service, now, and at the end of the service, you'll see a roll of various announcements that are being made. And uh, we are slowly transitioning to a time when you're going to hear fewer announcements being made from the pulpit, and we're going to ask you to please help us so that we can conserve time with an, to give us more time for ministry and the Word, to please look at the bulletin and read it, ask people at the Connect Center, or be, uh, give careful attention to the announcements that are on the board behind us before, during, and after service during the announcement time. And uh, it will be a great opportunity that way for you to, to know what's going on. We want you to be informed, but we also believe that, that uh, we are giving several opportunities, so please take advantage of those for your, for your information's sake. Uh, I want to thank you, first of all, thank you for... Uh, supporting the student ministries last week at the at the pasta luncheon. It was a great success, and I want to thank everybody for stopping, coming, being a part, and some people just gave and went on, and we want to thank you for supporting. How many know our students are very, very important, amen? And so we just need to, come on, give them a hand clap of praise, the pastors. And... Uh, also want to remind you that last week we said that we would be collecting for Joe Ash, which is the one time of year that we collect to receive uh, the improvements and updates that are needed here at the Church on the Rock, and uh, we do this once uh, during a year rather than try to labor ourselves every so many months or every so many weeks. We just do it once and for all and put our mind to other things. So we ask that you continue to pray for that and ask God, God what you would do. Uh, this Wednesday evening in the class that I am teaching, uh, the verse by verse class, we are going to con we are going to start a brand new time of verse by verse teaching in the. The Galatians, in Galatians. So if you're going to be there Wednesday night, and I hope that you are, go ahead and have the first chapter read. And uh, if you didn't catch it, next week at 5 o'clock, there's a leaders meeting, but 6 o'clock is the meeting itself. Please, please be here. If you are a department head or you're a leader, you're one of those that meet prior to service or one of those that are in a different area that you lead, it doesn't matter whether it's on a Wednesday, whether it's on a, a, a Sunday, please be here. We appreciate that so much. Um, if you're interested in going to the Holy Lands, please see Pastor Gabriel. There's still time for you to get in, and we're, we're assembling a team that can go there. And finally, we began our first class in the DNA Discipleship Course. There's still time for you to get in. If you weren't able to come, if you were running late, there's still time for you to come in next week. So please be here at 9 o'clock. And, we'll, and we're going to be studying on what we believe. How many know it's important to know what you believe? Amen? Uh, there's nothing sadder than a Christian that doesn't know what they believe. And I believe that when you go to a church that you should know what they believe. Amen? You should know what they believe. And, and uh, that's what we endeavor to do uh, at that time. How many love the Lord? Say a good amen. I feel a good spirit of God in this place. And, and I, I feel the presence of the Lord in this place. And I want you to know something, that God can do anything when he's present. The only thing he cannot do is that which we will not allow him to do. That which we will not allow him to do. And I feel like there's a lot of people in this place this morning that need something and want something from God. Um, so it's so good to see you here at The Rock this morning. Wow. We've been sharing the last few weeks on this series on Sunday mornings called Welcome to the Rock. Welcome to, no, no, Welcome to the Rock. Welcome to the Kingdom. <laughs> Jesus is the Rock, but I mean, that's not the title. Welcome to the Kingdom. And I want to start off by asking you a question this morning. I had the opportunity to think about the sermon this morning and study and prepare several days this week, actually. How many here have ever been to another country other than the United States? Would you lift your hand? Over here, over here, over here. It's not a trick question. You know what I find interesting going to all these different countries? Whenever I go to a different country, so many times, 
everything about the culture and everything about the people is different than the United States. You know that? I mean, laws vary, dress varies, food varies, uh, customs vary from country to country. How many remember that? Have you ever gone to a country and you're going, we don't do it like that back home? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, so here in the U.S., well, give me a gap. I'll give you a couple examples. Here in the U.S., we normally drive on the right side of the road. At least you're supposed to. Right? Unless you're passing somebody, right? But if you go to certain countries like Trinidad, Tobago, they drive on the left side of the road. So their laws are different than our laws. How many see what I'm saying? If you go to Japan, and we had the chance to go there a few years ago. My mother is, is of Japanese and was in, she's in glory now. But we went there, and one of the first things we noticed was how clean the country was. I mean... If you go to New York and go to the subway, you hold on to your wallet, your purse, and you just pray to God. In Japan, the subways are so clean you can eat off the floor. Think about it. You walk around from block to block, public places, parks and everything, and you do not see one trash can. You go, what? Yeah, it's true. Not one trash can you're going to find any place in Japan. But if you walk around in the U.S., it's quite common to see trash receptacles everywhere. What do they do? They take their trash with them until they get home, and they empty it at home. You go to a bathroom in Japan, and, 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 you, and you wash your hands, and you look around for a towel. Now, this is not, and you can't find one. Now, this is not unusual if you go to McDonald's or certain places like that. This should happen, but don't. Come on, somebody. There's nothing worse washing your hands and going, where's the towel? But you go there in that country and they have no towel dispensers because everybody carries around a little towel with them wherever they go and puts it in their pocket or puts it in their purse. Total different custom, total different everything. How many get what I'm saying? You, you, we went to Malawi and we were there one day and we were in the village and we were we were preaching and teaching, and, and we had a group that we went to Malawi, and, and uh, a group of people needed to go to the bathroom. We said, where's the restrooms at, the public restrooms? And they said, they're over there. And we looked around. We saw a building. I said, okay, because we were on the back side. We walk up on this building, and it's a three-sided building, a back and sides. And there were no divisions and no stalls in between, but there were eight holes in the ground. talk about culture shock. We're saying, well, we're still on. Where's the bathroom? You just choose a hole, buddy. So you're walking by like this almost, because everybody's grunting and groaning as you're walking by. All kinds of noises and disgusting things going on. And you, you, you take your position over this hole and you do your business. And then you look around for toilet paper. There is no toilet paper. And you're going, this is, this is wrong. This is just wrong. So your question is, what'd you do? Well, that's another story. <laughs> but, but, the, but what I want to tell you is that when you go to different places, those places have been influenced by cultures and events and situations and people groups that have gone in there before you. If you go to Hawaii today and you fly into any of their large cities, it looks just like a western city. With, it wasn't for the fact that you had to go across a lot of water before you got there. When you land in the city, you see everything that you see in our large cities. English is spoken. They use the dollar. They have electricity. They have public places just like we do. But you need to understand that it wasn't always like that because Hawaii used, was settled by the Polynesians way, way back. And the Polynesians with their li island lifestyle was, was exactly that, an island lifestyle. 
and then the becomes a, a territory of the United States in 1898 and becomes a state of the United States in 1959. And because it becomes a state of the United States, it was a territory, became become a state of the United States, Hawaii, the minute it became a territory, the U.S. started dumping in their assets and their cultures and their money and their knowledge and their intellect into this place. And slowly the islands came out of the islands and became more like a part of the United States with the language with the opportunities, with the schooling, and all the things that we have here back in the home country. No different if you go there today. As a matter of fact, if you want to know about what the islands are like, you can't see it in the big cities. You've got to go to a cultural center, or maybe you might find a luau, and they tell the story, and they do the dance, and they do the song and everything, and they, they have the food that's relevant to back then. But you can't just find it on every street corner. Because whoever came in and colonized the country that what used to be has now made it into something else. And everybody lives that way. How many hear what I'm saying? Jesus came preaching, saying, Luke 4, 43, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God because that is why I was sent. The only message that Jesus ever preached was the kingdom of God. You're saying, well, I don't know if I believe that. You need to believe that. He taught a lot of different things. Most of the time, he just did things and didn't really teach about it. He didn't sit down and say, okay, all you guys sit down here. I'm going to spend two, two or three weeks, about 10 classes on how to multiply bread and fish. He didn't do it. He said, bring me the bread and fish. Before he raised Lazarus from the dead, he didn't set them all down here and teach them hermeneutics and all that they had to know in the 15 points of raising the dead. Because it wasn't 15 points. He just said, roll away the stone. So he did a lot of great, fantastic things that we all believe in and we hold dear and true, because he did. But the only thing he preached on, listen, Kurt, is about the kingdom of God. And that's why this message this morning is I want to talk to you about the kingdom of God, the beginning and the end. It's the title of my message this morning. So just prior to Jesus beginning his public ministry, where he preaches the good news. And the good news is this. You can have eternal life. You can be a part of this kingdom and have everything that God offers you if you just believe what I say. This was a dangerous message because there were so many in society at the time that Jesus came calling him everything, looking at his disciples and said they were just troublemakers and they were rebellious and what's this new doctrine and it, it, this can't be the Messiah. He didn't come in on a white horse. No, that's next time. He didn't come in with great armies. No, that's next time. He came in in a way that you and I can relate to. He didn't come in with great wealth as a king. He came in born of a woman in a world that has been trampled down and destroyed by sin, in a world where people are hurting and in bondage, the Son of God came and he said, I came for this reason, to establish the kingdom of God. Now there was a man called the forerunner of Jesus called John the what? And he comes preaching this message Matthew 3, 2. Repent of your sins, turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Repent of your sins and turn to God because the kingdom of heaven is right here. John was not that light and John was not that king of the kingdom. John was the announcer of the light and the announcer of the king that was coming, the Messiah. Please understand, he had a place, he had a, something to fulfill, and he did it. Now, if you and I had, had been living in those days, and we, all of a sudden we, we heard this, there's a guy standing out in the Jordan River, and he's baptizing people. We said, what's his name? John the Baptist. Let's go check him out. Let's go check him out. He's talking about a king. He's talking about some kingdom or something. Well, first thing you'll notice is he's unconventional. He's not like other prophets. He's not like other preachers. 
One of the reasons maybe is because he spent the last 18 years in the wilderness, in the desert, alone with God, away from the social, away from the cultures of men. It was just God and John the Baptist for 18 years, and he, he ate off of the land, and he, and he spent time fasting and praying. He spent time. He, he was brought into a home that honored the Lord, honored God, and was waiting for Messiah. And how great it was when God spoke to him and said, you are the announcer of Messiah, because he's coming. He's coming. How will you know? You'll know. Just keep preaching the message. Just keep sharing the truth. You'll know. You don't have to know every detail, but tell them that he's coming. I'm going to tell you today, that's the same message we have. We are forerunners of the the second coming of Christ, and our message is he's coming. He's coming. He's coming. We don't have to know what he's, where we, but we don't have to know what time, we don't have to know what hour, but he's coming. And God will use you in a mighty way just like he did, John. John the Baptist wasn't a normal preacher. He comes dressed in a one-piece camel skin suit. He has not any designer shirt, flashy cufflinks, doesn't have the designer shoes or socks. Doesn't have a fancy mailing list. He doesn't have a television program, a radio program. He doesn't preach under flashy lights, smoke-filled rooms. He stands in the middle of a river called Jordan and he says, prepare for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent of your sins and get ready. Get ready. If you and I were standing beside the Jordan River hearing him say that out there, And looked at him, we go, are you kidding me? This guy looks like something the dog's drugged in. If you look down at his feet while he stand beside the Jordan River, his feet were muddy. The bottoms of his garment was muddy. He dressed odd. You and I maybe would have cringed if he even reached out to touch us. Because if we got really close to him, we'd go, whoa, 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 whoa. His hair, it's not, it's not fancy. It's not cofured. His, his fingernails got mud and junk all underneath them. And they're, they're not manicured. If you got close enough to John the Baptist, and, and probably the only ones that saw this were the people that actually got baptized, and you got close enough and you saw his hair, his hair was out like this. Maybe he had one of the original afros, I don't know. I'm serious. He didn't care. You get close enough and you could see his beard. And you look at it really close and it's matted and dried and hunks and chunks. And you realize what's going on with this beard. It's dried honey that's matted all over his beard. You can't even run a comb through it like some of your pets. And you look a little closer, John, and and you're going, oh my goodness, look at this guy. He's so radical looking. And and you notice on on his upper lip, across the mustache, there's a few locust legs hanging. And you're thinking, what am I going to do with this guy? If he would walk into our church, the security would come to him. If he'd go to a convention, if he'd go to an assembly of people, they'd be taking him to another room and asking him, what are you doing here? But he didn't care what he looked like. And he didn't care what other people thought about him. He had a message. You only had one message. You don't get a series of messages from John the Baptist. Come and order my three cassette series or three, my three CD or my three, is one message. Turn from your sin, repent, because God's kingdom is near. No, he didn't look like a prophet and he didn't look like a preacher anybody would seen. You think he looked radical? How many think that would be pretty radical? If you come up here to be prayed for and all of a sudden you see matted stuff and just locust legs hanging out and 
hair and everywhere and dirty feet and you're going, oh. As radical as that may have looked and people still came, what was more radical than how he looked was the message that he was sharing. His looks paled in comparison to the message that he was sharing. He was given a message that there's coming a spiritual worldwide revolution. Somebody is coming and is bringing a revolution that will reach the entire world. And I'm announcing now before he gets here so you can get ready. There is going to be a new reign. Messiah is coming back. He's coming back. You're saying coming back? Yeah. You see, he had been here before, but nobody knew that. He had been here before, but nobody understood that he was a part of the garden experience where he said, let us make them into our own image, talking about Adam and Eve. Yeah, he had been there before. John the Baptist was adamant. He says, even now, the kingdom of God is being established in the world. Listen up. Even now, God's kingdom is being established. Now, this is all before Jesus is preaching for three and a half years. This is all before Jesus is crucified. This is all before he's even been baptized. All this has been going on. But at the end, three and a half years later, after John baptizes him in the Jordan, turn with me to John 18. John 18, 33 through 36 says this. It was Pilate that asked him, are you the king of the Jews? The king of the Jews. Notice the language here. Jesus said, is this your question or did others tell you about me? He's asking, are you, see, it's kind of like what I said about the music. It's about the song. Are you singing words that other people are talking about? Words that other people are saying? Or do you really know about the people you're singing about? That's what Jesus has said. And then Pilate says, am I a Jew? Your own people and their leading priests brought you to me for trial. Why? What have you done? And Jesus answered and said, my, what's it say? Kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. What was Jesus saying? First of all, he did not say he was not a king. He's saying, I am a king, but my kingdom is not of this world. Notice he said it's not of this world. His kingdom cannot be restricted to a tiny place called earth. When you think of all the galaxies and heavens and all of the things that have been made by God, spoken and existed by God, he says, you know, earth is not my kingdom. I am not here being, making this my kingdom, but he's basically saying, I am not of earth, I am in the earth right now. Now, how does all this line up with what we've been taught? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How many remember that? During that course of time on the sixth day, he created man. How many know what I'm talking about? And he says, on in the scripture, I think around the 28th verse or so, or maybe it's chapter two, he said, let's make man after our own image. Let us make man after our own image. So in the creation of man, there was the involvement of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. So we know back in the day when the beginning of the earth was formed and God created man, God the Son, Jesus, was here. Along with God the Spirit and God the Father, Spirit was here. God created earth, created the heavens and the earth, that earth and everything that was created by God in it, which God loved and saw very good, everything it created, was to be a colony, an outpost. Follow me. Where we're living was supposed to be an outpost of heaven. Just like Hawaii, outpost of the United States. Just like Outpost. Hello. 
Just like Jamaica is an outpost of the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of God. Can we turn this, turn this off, will you? About that. So God creates the heaven and the earth. Is that better? God creates the heaven and the earth, creates earth, makes man, makes woman, makes everything in it, says, I made it, it's all mine. Now what I want you to do there is I want you as a colony of heaven to bring the culture of heaven here, the government of heaven here, the laws of heaven here. Let this colony live under and serve the king of heaven. And it was going pretty good until man sinned. And the moment that man sinned, he forfeited his dominion. He, he forfeited what God had given him, and man was no longer able to function with the authority and power that he had before because sin stood between him and God. From that time until the coming of the Lord, the earth has been up for grabs, and Satan is doing everything to grab everybody and everything he can. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that, that, that uh, the world belongs to Satan is what it basically says. He's the ruler of this world is what the Bible says. He's not the creator of this world, but he's the ruler of this world. So he rules it with his culture now, the sin, the immorality. The lying, the murder, the cheat, all of this stuff. He rules it with his culture, the death, the disappointments. He rules it and governs it with his culture and his demonic horde. That's what's going on right now. And then Jesus is born. Jesus is born and he said, look at here. I have come to preach the kingdom of God. I am come to establish God's colony back on this earth. I am come to take what God owns and what really belongs to God and give it back to God. I have come that the, what I teach you, what I show you, what you see happening from me and what I'm teaching you here in my life and what I'm saying, that you pick this up, that you believe with all your heart, and you go out and you begin to influence this earth under the dominion of Satan. You begin to influence under the authority of Jesus Christ. I will give you signs, wonders, and miracles. I will, you will see people sick and they'll be healed. You'll see people dead, they'll be raised from the dead. You'll see people that, you'll see people that are a demon possess and the demons will flee because I will give you the dominion and the power that comes from my kingdom so that you can do my work, so that we can take this place back to God for God. When you and I understand that's the reason we're here, God. We think, well, God, I'm getting, oh, I need to get saved because I need his peace. That's just a small part of what that's all about. I need help. That's just a small part. See, because God just doesn't save us. He saves us to something. There's no such thing as God just saving me. God, what do you want to do? Just save me. Okay, I'm saved. I said the prayer. Good, that's good. No, no, no. If you said the prayer and you said that prayer, that means when you repented, that when you, Jesus Christ has come in your heart, when the Holy Spirit's now in your life, when you walk out of this place, you are now on an assignment to turn this colony of Lee Summit, to turn this colony of Missouri, to turn this colony called the United States, to influence this colony called the earth for the Lord so that it can come back to God, so the culture of Christ can be preached and shown to the lost, that this world can be changed. Please understand, you're thinking way too small. That's why Jesus always talked of an urgency. He knew he'd only be here for just a short time. And what he had to teach them, he couldn't teach them through a class. He couldn't teach them by huddling them all together and keeping them from the world. He said, I'm not keeping you from the world. I'm sending you into the world. Don't be huddled back. Don't be afraid. Don't be fearful what they're doing. I'm sending you into the world. Because it's the world that needs to see the power of God released through the people of God. Remember, the kingdom of God has a king. It's Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God has a family. That's you and I, the sons and daughters of God. And we have a position in Christ. We have been given dominion and authority as sons and daughters. What Adam and Eve lost, we gained when we become a son and daughter of God. 
And we must live according to the fact that we are sons and daughters of God. We've got to start thinking different, living different, purposing different. Because we can't say that we are part of the kingdom and we're sons and daughters and still live like the ruler of this world, Satan. Think like this world. Be influenced by like this world. Jesus said, the greatest commandment is that you should love the Lord God your heart with all your mind, heart, and soul. And he said the second greatest commandment is that we should love our neighbors as ourselves, that we would love God. And here's the key. When we love God with everything, our mind, heart, and soul, that means we, we, we are we're living Him and making Him the Lord of our life. We're not trying to determine if we're going to serve God today in some things and other than some things we're not going to. If we're loving God with all of our heart, mind, and soul, it's not a matter of, of letting our mind overtake us and, and us just to make up excuses for why we can't change or why we can't be different. It's the fact that we know that all things will work together for me because I love the Lord. When I am a child of the King of God, the kingdom of God, and I am here to live and introduce God's culture and kingdom, I can't, listen, how can I influence the world and let them know that they can trust Him when I can not trust Him? How can I influence the world and let them know that, that He's my provider when I don't believe He'll provide for me? How can I believe and, and tell them God will deliver you when, when I won't even be delivered because I've I got so much doubt? When we truly follow the Lord with all of our heart and soul and love Him with all of our heart and soul, we'll find ourselves going from glory to glory to glory, to victory to victory to victory to victory. And some people, you know what I'm talking about. You've had to take a step at a time, and every step you took got victory. Every step you took got victory. And God's saying today for you that are here, when we change our mind about why we're here and what we're doing here, that we're going to influence the kingdom of God and so that God's kingdom and culture can come back to our families and to our churches and to our cities and then God will begin to do something in a very special way. This is about preaching until Jesus comes back. This is about preaching to these lost, to these dying people so that they can be saved. Let you in on a little secret. Not everybody's going to believe God's word. Not everybody's going to come to Jesus. There are some out there that are going to scoff at you and going to ridicule you because it's always been that way. Satan has such a hold over some men's and women's minds and hearts that they're just not going to budge. They're not going to change to live for God. I want you to know something else. You are now in the minority in the United States. There are fewer Christians percentage-wise living in the United States than in any other time. There may be more numerically, but the percentage of people that are claiming to be Christians are smaller now than any other time in the history of this nation. Only in the 40 percentile range are people that confess to be Christians. There was a day that was 70, 80 percent. But every time, every so often, it just goes down and down and down. What's that saying? When you see the percentage of people that are Christians in the United States go down, it means that the world is culturally more involved in changing people for Satan than we are for God. How many hear what I'm saying? Here's the good news. God has made it possible for you and I to take dominion and have authority to pray for people that people get healed in Jesus' name, that people are delivered in Jesus' name, that miracles can be done at the name of Jesus, not just so we can put mailing lists and look fancy and look religious before people. It is so that His culture, His kingdom can be established on this earth. And the real truth of the matter is when that becomes our heartbeat because it was the heartbeat of Jesus, then all these excuses start going away. We have allowed ourselves to have so many excuses why we cannot do something for God that has, has disabled us to be culturally relevant and see magnificent signs and wonders for God. You should be a miracle looking for the place to happen. Let me tell you, you should be a miracle looking for a place to happen, not looking for a miracle all the time for yourself.
We should be searching out people that need Jesus rather than waiting for them to come to us. By the love that we have for God and to each other, that should attract them to say, well, what's, what's up with you? You're different. But if they don't see it, if it's not shown, then they don't see any difference. My friend, Jesus is coming back. Could be today. Could be. You're saying, oh, Pastor, I've heard that so long. I've heard it. Yeah, I know you have. But what bothers me isn't that you've heard it. The problem is there's no urgency because you've heard it. I mean, I want to encourage you. Get your piece of paper and write down a half a dozen names of people that you know need the Lord, or at least you feel like they need the Lord. How, you can't judge them, but you could say, based on what the, the Word of God says, those walking with the Lord and those aren't walking with the Lord, these folks don't see, appear to be walking with God, so I'm going to start praying for them. I'm going to start praying for their souls. How many hear what I'm talking about? Let's not make life all about getting up and going to work, cooking dinner, washing clothes, washing the car, paying our bills, then going back to work and doing this and then taking one or two days a week and trying to find a little rest. Let's not make that, giving God a Sunday morning and a couple hours. Let's not make it that way. Let's make it, hey, you know what? God's given me a job so that I can support my ministry. God's put me in a place where I can reach people with him and influence the culture of God there in that place where there doesn't appear to be a culture for God. God's going to use me in such a way that, that if I have to leave that place because of my testimony, God's going to show me a different ground to go to that I, that's going to be more open. How many hear what I'm saying? If you go to the church on Rock here and you're not a guest, but you've been here for very long, you need to be the most inspiring, loving people type of person there can be. I mean, when people come in the doors, we ought, to be, we ought to be looking for people to love for Jesus. Most people do a pretty good job, but there's some, you know, you, you just, well, I'm shy. Get over it. If everybody was shy, there's a Christian, nobody get lost, nobody get found. How many I'm talking about? Nobody be saved. He's given you the Holy Ghost and power so that you don't have to worry about your timidity. God has not given us a the power of fear or timidity, but he's given us the power of his spirit to be strong. Pastor, you don't know about me. I was born on the wrong side of the track, so I was raised without a dad or mom, or I was, I was this or that. I, I said, you know, you have had a tragic life, but let me tell you something. How long do you want to stay chained to that past when God has such a great future for you? i got to say that again. I like that one. How long do you want to be chained to your past when he has promised you such a great future? How long do you want to be chained to your addiction when he has promised you such great freedom? How long do you want to keep speaking the words out of your mouth that you don't, really don't want to when he said, I'll fill your mouth with my words? How long do you want to be laying there in hopelessness and despair when he says, I'll give you hope? How long do you want to be fatherless when he said, I'll be your father, I'll be your mother, I'll be your brother, and I'll be your sister, I'll be whatever you need me for me to be? How long do we want to stay in those circumstances? Because as long as we decide to let the world influence us in this culture, and we don't influence the world in God's culture, we will stay in that mess. God is calling us out in these last days to live a life of victory in such a way that the world scratches their head and go, how can you be happy with all you're going through? How can you, how can you put a smile on your face with the stuff that you've gone through? How can you do this? And you're going to look at them and say, I can't, but God did, and that's it. I think we need to be a people to say, Jesus did it, Period. When people ask you stupid questions or questions, you know, you, you know what? That's what the period. This Jesus did this for me. It's time, church. Listen, it's time. Is there anybody here who wants to see God work powerfully in your life? Come on. Wouldn't you want to get to a place where you don't want to have to have all the prayers for yourself? 
because your life is just crippled with all this different stuff. Wouldn't you like to be a place where that's, you're basically strong and taken care of that you can reach out to others? How many, how many want that? Let me see you. Okay, for those of you that raise your hands, if that's your goal, God will help you with that. But if we never make that our goal, that's never going to happen. God's just not going to come upon me one day, and I'm going to walk down the road, and he's all of a sudden going to slap me. Boom! i got to speak to you, Tony Hensley. And he starts telling me stuff. I never wanted a Damascus Road experience like Paul had. Never, 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 never. And the more set in our ways we are and the more, the more dug in we are into this world, the more he has to kind of knock us off the donkey a little bit. But the bottom line is this, God loves you so much that there wasn't anything he wouldn't do that was within himself to bring you to him. He loved you when you weren't lovely. He loved you when everybody gave up on you. He loved you when you were living for the world and living for yourself. And you did not get saved because you came forward and said a prayer. Anybody can say a prayer. I can give you a piece of paper. You can recite it. That will mean you're saved. You are saved because you put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ. You've repented and turned from your sins. You understand that you do not belong to yourself now, but you belong to God. Say, I belong to God. And because you belong to God, you have a Father that's in heaven that's got a place. He's preparing a place for you. I told the class this morning, I said, oh, I, we, need to get on, we need to get going. We need to start moving. We need to start, now I'm telling you this, we need to start moving as a church, as individuals, to start living and living a kingdom life and not just, the, just trying to fit Jesus into our schedule or just fit Jesus into our life. No, it, he don't fit Jesus into your life. Jesus is your life, man. If he's not your life, he's not your Lord. If he's not your Lord, you're not saved. You can't say that. If he's not your life, he's not your Lord, if he's not your Lord, you're not saved. I said it again. It's that simple. Well, I don't believe like you do. That's fine as long as you believe the way Jesus does. And you believe the Bible, and I'm hoping that I am believing and teaching what he says. I mean, what I'm talking about. I'm trying. Come on. Look at her. Say, poor guy's trying. Amen. This world's going to mess with your mind, man. This world is going to try to teach you because the culture is the world to make it as easy, as you, easy on you as you can so that you don't have to change anything, so you don't have to do anything, so that all this stuff is like free benefits given to you. I love the benefits God gives to his children, but I think we, we're in a problem. We believe all those benefits go to everybody, that even aren't his children. If we're trying to live a righteous life and trying to live for God, they said there's a lot of things God said I promise you and I would do for you so that it will enable you to live in my kingdom and show people my kingdom and dominion and power, to show people my love. I will do all these things for you. But don't expect any of those things if you're not making Jesus first in your life. And I'm speaking to you that are watching online today. There are a lot of people watch online. They're in countries that, that are, they would do anything to have a Bible. Serious. I'm going to tell you, 2020, I'm asking God to reveal to me and show me things how we can absolutely go out there into this world and make a difference. I'm asking God to show me and show you different ways that that we understand to connect with the world doesn't mean that they have to connect with a local body and a local church only on Sunday morning. To connect with God, it means that they let Jesus come in and let him live through them every day of the week. Don't be surprised when he starts working and saving people that have the worst mess in their lives, the worst case scenario in their life. Don't be surprised when he brings people that are, that are unconventional and different like John the Baptist to service. Don't be looking down at them because they're out there preaching the message. Come on, somebody. We prop them up and we go out and do the same thing. Why, why is it if I am part of the kingdom of God and I am supposed to establish the kingdom culture in my house, why am I allowing certain things on television that destroy the kingdom culture? 
why am I allowing music that they're listening to? They're talking about all kinds of sexual things and all kinds of perverse things. Why am I allowing that in my presence, in my being, with my children, in my house, when I'm supposed to be established in a kingdom culture? Why can't I tell somebody that's not God? No. No, you're not marrying another man. Not in my house. No. Because I believe God made man to be married to a woman. I still do. Well, get over it. You need to get, you need to, you need to get hip. You need to become a part of what's going on today. I don't want to be what's going on today. I'm trying to influence this culture. Well, they're not going to like you. They didn't like Jesus. I'm not setting out to make everybody hate me and and dislike me, but I'm setting out to offer truth so that the power of God, because the truth shall set you free. You will never be free as long as you believe the lie. I'm not going to pat you on the back and say, it's okay to take drugs and drink. It's okay to sleep around. I'm not going to pat you on the back and tell you that. I'm going to tell you God loves you, I love you, here's the truth, now do something with it. You're invited to come back, you're invited to hear the word, you're invited. But bottom line is, don't, let make, don't tell me I have to affirm what you do in order to affirm you. I do not have to affirm what you're doing to affirm you. I can look at you and say, hey, I appreciate you. There are good things about you, there are things that you're doing, I affirm you. I love you in Jesus like a brother. I love you in sister like a brother. But I do not affirm what you're doing. I do not affirm the rebellion, the sin, the corruption, the, the homosexuality, the immorality. I do not affirm what you're doing. There's parents in here. You need to stand up to your children. People yell up and say, I love you, but I don't affirm some of the things you're doing. And I won't allow it because I'm trying to establish a culture. And if you get too close, you're going to try to destroy everything God's telling me to establish in this world. That's why he said, watch out who you're hanging with. If you're hanging with this type of people, people are going to think that that's the way you are. And you just ruin your witness and you just ruin establishing a culture in this world. Shame on preachers that are going to bars and drinking with everybody. Well, we'll hold our small group down to the local tavern tonight. Sitting around playing beer pong with everybody as a crowd breaker. Shame on you. Why do you say that? God loves you. I love you in Christ. But you don't think you're going to be sitting around heaven doing that, do you? You don't think that doing that, you're establishing the culture of God. I know I'm stepping on some feet this morning. But you need to hear this. You can't go and get to where you want to get to the way that you're headed, the road that you're on. Man, you're supposed to be the head of your home. Woman, you're supposed to be the helpmate to your husband no matter how big of a dud he is. And you're supposed to love each other like Christ loved the church. You don't affirm their sin even though you love them. And yes, even under some certain situations when it gets really hard, even under some situations where you're physically in a place where you, you're facing physical things, unbearable and things that are so hard that it threatens your life, yeah, God does allow and permit certain situations for divorce. But the bottom line is that's not the first thing up. I still believe it's to have and to hold for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer from this day forward. And if you don't start out in a marriage and believe that through your marriage, you're just asking for something to come in to disrupt your marriage. Because there's some days you don't look so beautiful. There's some days where that guy that you married that was so muscular, so strong, always wore that cologne, now he's scratching his big belly and reaching out and burping. There's some days that old wife that you came to, you know, that loved you and so good to you, that cooked every meal, and all of a sudden, let's go ahead and eat. Well, I don't want to go ahead and eat again. I don't feel like cooking. Well, I didn't feel like going to work today. And there you go, the battle begins. Is this okay? I'm not changing, so. Back when we were fourth in Douglas, it's the first real church we were in because we 
we started out in the storefront, and then we went to the school at Westview for a while, and we were at Fourth and Douglas. And Fourth and Douglas was a was an amazing place that God gave us because it was across the street from the Dairy Queen. Don't look at me that way. It was all God. And 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 the beautiful thing about Fourth and Douglas was was I my office what. It was about the size of a broom closet, actually. It wasn't very big. And I was able to stand up and look out of the window because it overlooked the the parking area there. It was just south on the south side of the church. And on Sunday mornings, one of the great things that I did that kind of gave me a kick, how many know sometimes you got a weird sense of humor? How many know what I'm talking about? I I remember looking out, and many times I could see certain cars and certain people coming in, and and they turned around their seat doing this to the kids like fighting them off with all their might. And then, then you can see the car stop and park and somebody turn around doing this for, for the next 30 seconds, and they're telling them, well, don't, you, know, you better be good, and you don't, be embarrassed, don't embarrass me, blah, 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 blah. And then they walk out of the car, and they're just... Hello, brother. Yeah, praise God, it's all good. Yeah, glory to God, isn't God good? 60 seconds earlier, they were fighting for their lives with their arms flailing, threatening their kids within an inch of their life. If they embarrassed them, they would get it when they get home. I love those days. Because I know who they were. But there's a little bit of all of us in that, isn't there? We're going to go through stuff. We're going to go through... But the bottom line, as long as my heart's bent towards God and I want to serve him, and every day I get up, I say, I'm going to give you my heart. I'm going to give you my life. I'm going to make you Lord. Today, I consciously, with all my heart, put you first in my life. When that happens, the Holy Spirit can do something with you because you volunteered something to him that he couldn't take, but he would receive if you gave it to him, your life. That's why prayer is so important. It's affirming your life to God. It's handing your life back over to God every day when you pray. And it's amazing because some days we don't do that and things begin to pile up and then you can't remember the last time you spent 20 minutes alone with God. And we wonder why we can't hear God and we wonder why we feel like we do and we wonder why the world's closing in, wonder why relationships aren't working out, you wonder why you start feeling anger and bitterness and hatred and unforgiveness and and cynicism and criticism and all these isms. It's because you got to submit yourself to the king always to live in his kingdom. Always. And that's all we're trying to do here. We're trying to teach you and love you and point you to the king so that you make up your mind you want to live for God king, you want to be a part of the kingdom and encourage you with truth and encourage you with prayer and encourage you with the power of the Holy Spirit that does what he does best, give you power to live for God so that when you leave this place, you don't have to look at somebody and say, well, won't you come to church with me next Sunday? They're going to pray and you can receive Jesus, so they'll pray for you to get healed. No, you say, you know, I'm going to do it right here. Because I'm a son of the king. I'm a daughter of the king, and I believe he'll do it right here. And when we start thinking that way, the day will come when people will come with you to church that have already been prayed over, already received their miracle, already received Jesus, and you're just walking down the aisle with them as a brother and sister in the Lord, just saying, oh, yeah, we're celebrating together publicly. If you're new here, if, or if you've not been in church long, we call ourselves brothers and sisters here. Oh, that's old-fashioned. I don't care because I look at it as a kingdom situation. I'm a part of a royal family. Jesus is the king. I'm a part of the royal family. I'm a son of God. You're a daughter or son of God. The person sitting next to you that have the same kingdom, belong to the same king, that's your brother. That's your sister. That's why we can't talk about them. That's why we can't gossip about them. That's why we can't point fingers at them. Because you see what actually happens when you do that, you're pointing fingers at your own family. You're actually pointing fingers at your own family. That's how God looks at it. 
Are you sure? Absolutely. So would you, would you bow your heads? I'm done. Bow your heads, please. I need your help. There's a fire burning inside of me that I could say hasn't burned like it has been now. For, it's been a while. I've been feeling this, but... I felt like this year is the time that this fire is going to burn, and, and we need to let the fire out. We need to let it become uncontained. Wildfires are uncontained. They go out and spread everywhere. It makes a change wherever they go. Things look different. Things feel different. And there's no doubt wherever a wildfire goes, wherever a fire goes, that you can see the influence in what's going on. I believe God wants the fire of the Holy Ghost to be let out in you. I believe God wants you through the power of the Spirit to live a life, a radical life, where you no longer care about what people say, think, or do about you. I believe that you understand that the day is coming and now is that those that worship the Lord will worship Him not just in spirit but also in truth. That we need the Holy Spirit to proclaim Him and, to, and help us live for Him, but we need the truth of God's Word to know how to live for Him. We are governed by God's Word in this kingdom. The laws come from the Word of God in this kingdom. Get in that Bible, brother, sister, and pray. Get in that Bible and spend time with God and know what He's saying to us. Don't believe everything you hear from everybody. As much as I could say you can believe me, it would be wrong for you to go home without looking at what I've said. You need to look at it. You need to pray about it. Amen. Until that truth is just burning inside of you. You want to know what happens when truth burns in you long enough? You, you become holy. Because that truth that burns in you burns out the dross and the junk. And what's left is pure. And that's holy to the Lord. You want to see God? You want to see more of Him? You want to see His power? You want to see His love, His glory? Let that truth burn in you. That truth will separate you from all the things that the world is trying to give you. And you will see God because it says, without holiness, no man shall see God. Our sins prohibit us from seeing God. Our sins steal from us. Don't let him do it any longer. Don't let him do it any longer. Stand with me all over this house. Stand with me all over this house. No moving around, no leaving. I know you might feel uncomfortable doing this. But I believe if we can do this around brothers and sisters, sooner or later, the strength and the courage will build up where we can do this in the world where there aren't that many brothers and sisters around us. The Bible says, pray you one for another. We're going to take two or three minutes right now. I'm going to ask you to make circles of prayer. Listen closely. Six or eight people in each circle, no more than that. Six or eight people. If you have a specific need, physical, financial, whatever you can share, if you don't feel like you can share, just say, I have something I can't share, but please pray for me. I want you to pray in that group. I'm going to give you all but three or four minutes, like I said. We don't do this all the time, but I feel the Spirit of God's leading us to this right now. If you will get used to praying with people like this, then you will get used to talking to people in the world and praying with them. You're preparing for the kingdom. If you see somebody sitting around you, it's a guest, tell them, come on in, we want you. If you're afraid of holding hands, you don't have to hold hands. If you've been sick, you don't have to hold hands. But somebody take the lead. Say, anybody have any prayer requests? You might even start off with them. Go ahead. Let's have six or here. Come on. Back over here, two or three groups. Back over here, two or three. Move across the aisle and join them in. Move across the aisle and join them in. Go move out there. Come on. This is great, folks.